Well, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. I hope you can find the book Amos. Can you find the book Amos? The prophet Amos. I'll give you a little time there. It's not a book we uh, run to very often. It's a very powerful uh, message there in the book of Amos. We won't have the opportunity to go through the entire book. I'd like to. <clears throat> in fact, I've got a set of messages that uh, I preach that kind of offer a summary of each of the prophetic books. And we'll do that sometime in the next millennia. Amen. But Amos chapter 3, verse number 3. Amos 3, verse 3. If you're still having some trouble finding it, if you know where the book of Joel is, you're there. If you find Daniel, just keep going toward the New Testament. Flip, flip, flip. You'll, okay, I think everybody's there. Amos chapter 3, verse 3. The Bible says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Father, help me to preach this message with the clarity that, uh, that we need, Lord, to make judgments and decisions with regard to the question before us. I mean, things like, you know, um, uh, Amy Coney Barrett being nominated to the Supreme Court. We're excited about that. We thank you for that. But she's Catholic, Lord. What does that mean to us? <clears throat> We've started this new ministry, <clears throat> the Sidewalk Counseling Ministry, <clears throat> to uh, be there for these young ladies. And, and in some cases, the, the men. They're involved in the lives, uh, in, in the conception of this baby. To help them, Lord God, to turn from death as an answer to their problem. And to turn to you as an answer to their problem. But this does throw us in, of course, the, the uh, situation where there's some question about where do we draw lines with regard to participating in an event that includes Catholics or sometimes Mormons and some of these other groups and uh, how does all this work, Lord, when you've said to us, how could two walk together except to be agreed? Um, how much agreement do we need, Lord God, to walk together and to battle together and stuff like this? Help us, Lord, to, to clarify and sort these things out because they apply in a lot of other ways right now. I mean, uh, they had tens of thousands of people gather together for prayer on the Washington Mall. It was exciting. It was thrilling. Um, and yet we know that in that crowd there were a lot of people you know, counting beads and, and uh, praying Hail Marys and, and things like that. What does this mean, Lord, to us? How, how do we navigate uh, through all of this, Lord, and maintain the integrity of our faith <clears throat> and, uh, and, of course, uh, our integrity, Lord God, before you? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> so these are some pretty challenging questions. So the message is titled, The Dilemma of Christian Activism. <clears throat> and this is not a new thing and not a new issue. I had decided when uh, Mike uh, began, we, he, we began talking about launching this ministry. And, uh, and then that question came up when I think it was Joe that asked, you know, what do we do about these Catholics that show up at these things? How does this work? And uh, it alerted me to the fact that, yeah, that's, that's an understandable question. <clears throat> How do we sort this out? <clears throat> How do we, you know... <clears throat> What's our part in all this kind of stuff? Uh, they had this great uh, prayer for march or march pr <laughs> prayer march, <laughs> uh, prayer march on the Washington Mall. How many of you saw some bits and pieces of that? That yeah, was awesome. I I was thrilled. It was it was moving, and yet it presents a dilemma <clears throat> because you know is this the uh, uh, in Ventura? Every year they had something called the Symphony of Prayer, and there was an ecumenical thing where they gathered all the different groups together. And they wanted us to pray for rain. I've told you the story before. And we would bow out of that every time. Um, you know, at first, it was a little tense because they would come to my office all expecting me to be on board. And, and I would say, no, I really can't participate in that. And, and they would, sometimes they would argue with me. And sometimes they would, uh, you know, express very negative things about me. Uh, and even in public, you know, say bad things about me and, and so on. And uh, write bad things about me in the newspaper and stuff like this. So it was, it was, uh, you know, kind of an issue. And uh, but every year, this thing would get the the flyers would show up, symphony of prayer, and then I would go to the pulpit and preach my what became uh, a very popular sermon in our church. And 
well known out there uh, declaring our stand on the issue, I, I preach a message titled The Cacophony of Prayer. And so I preach that every year. And uh, let me finish the story since I got started on it. But here, what happened is uh, uh, one year, uh, by the way, it was in order to get rain because California was going through a drought. Some things never change. So we were in one of a we were in a drought. It was a nine year drought at that time. It was the ninth year of a drought, and there was quite a lot of concern about it. But I hadn't really led the church to pray about it in any serious way. I pray about it lightly. But anyway, I got called by these people. Got the got the literature, of course, in the mail, and said, "Oh, oh, it's time to pull that sermon out, the cacophony of prayer." And I threw it into the circular file, and uh, got a call. And it was a lady this time, and she said. We've, we had a meeting about this, and we've all decided, we're all agreed, you're the reason we don't have rain. <laughs> they put it all on me. <laughs> I said, really? And uh, she was, yeah, she went on to say, yeah, but she wasn't being mean, actually, by the way. She was just, we just decided this is the way it is. And so we need you to join us in this, in our symphony of prayer. We need you to be there. And I said, well, I've already explained this. And she interrupted me. No, we need, you need to be there. You're the reason we don't have rain. You keep saying this to us. You keep not coming. And that's the only thing that's, that we can think is that you're not there. So therefore, it's not unity. We haven't got the unity we need. We have to have unity or God won't bless us. I said, nah, the unity we need is the unity around the word of God. And, uh, and I gave her a few exhortations and just said, you know, but listen, I've said this to you guys a thousand times. I you know, <clears throat> and that's kind of like in the vein of 180 years in the, in the Senate. I, yeah, never mind. <clears throat> but I said, so I don't want to really go back over that again. We're not going to participate. She began to cry. Pfft. And what's a man to do? You get a woman blubbering on the other side of the phone, you know. And I, I don't want what do I do with this? So I prayed about it. I said, well, Lord, what do I do? I know you don't want me to go this way. And it hit me. The Lord wanted me to lead our church to pray, but not combine with them, not connect with them. So I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. So I'm going to lead our church to have a prayer meeting this coming Wednesday. And in our prayer meeting, I'm going to ask the church to pray for rain. And God is going to give us rain. And when God gives us rain, you need to know that it was when Wells Road Baptist Church prayed for rain. That's when God gave rain. That you guys have been doing this almost every year since I've been here. And it, you've never gotten rain. But you're going to get rain this year because we're going to pray as a church for rain. But we're not joining your group. Am I, am I understood? She goes, well, that's the best you can do. <laughs> I said, that's not, I'm going to talk about the best I can do. I'm telling you, you're going to get rain because this church is going to pray for it. That's why you're going to get rain. It will not be because of your ecumenical prayer meeting. So she said, well, okay. And so we hung up. And then I thought, oh, what have I got myself into here? But it was the Lord. And I went to the church. And sure enough, I, you know, I, I, I stumbled a little bit. I got a little sweaty thinking, man, I got myself into something here. So Lord, you better give us rain. <laughs> and, uh, but I got my faith, back, faith legs back under me. And, uh, and I went to the church, and I said, we're going to pray for rain. God's going to give us rain. And uh, so he told me that. So we're going to pray, and God's going to hear our prayer. He's going to give us rain. So I, I did more than that. I gave some verses, and we talked, and so on. And the church prayed. The church prayed fervently. And uh, when I first told them what I'd done, a few of the members said, what did you do? You know, but after I exhorted them from the Word of God, the faith, uh, boy, faith just filled that room, and, and the people prayed. And uh, I think it was within about four days rain came yeah it broke the drought so God does stuff like that and this message is going to be about about this kind of situation what do we do with with we're living in a world where the pressure is constantly for us to relax our distinctions right to let them basically just disappear and have us just kind of blend in with the rest of the Christian activist movement. On the other hand, 
I have recently written an entire book, God's War, that talks about our responsibility to engage in all of these things. So, you know, how do we, how do, we do this? How do we engage in what's called Christian activism without losing our distinctiveness? without maintaining that separation God calls for. How can two walk together if they're not agreed? If there's no agreement? Let me give you a couple of other verses that serve as foundation for the message. Open your Bible to 2 Corinthians 6, verse number 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. We were at the uh, Planned Parenthood yesterday here in Santa Maria. And, of course, I, I knew there would be, and glad to have their help. Some Catholics show up, and they're on the other side of the street praying, and then some the Catholic lady shows up at the thing there. She's very good at this. Uh, yeah, she's very willing to talk and to engage, and she has good things to say, and she's very effective. Um, so, you know, but right away, you're like, huh. And I don't know why. By the way, why did she come over and give me that sign? Do you? Oh, okay. So some conversation didn't go over there, go on over there that caused her to decide to come over. Because her timing was just so interesting to me. But anyway, I'm not going to go further into that. But uh, I'm standing there, and then she comes over, and I, I, I don't want to get bogged down in that, but she gives me the sign to hold. So, all right. So, so did this Catholic woman just take over our meeting? And start directing what people are going to do? Is that, is that what's happening here? Hmm. It's interesting. You know how the damsel followed Paul? These men speak the true sayings of God. These men speak the, the way of salvation. Well, who could get angry at that? Right? But Paul put up with that for a little while. Pretty soon you know, he cast the devil out of her. So the devil, my point with that story, by the way, isn't to say that this lady's a devil. <laughs> it is to say, however, that that's what the devil does. He's going to, somewhere in these situations, he's going to try to start working, uh, breaking down the barriers. He's going to do that. So we have to understand how this works. Now, so what's my response to that? You're not going to make me into a Catholic. What? Well, that's like, no duh. Right? That, we understand that. And not even that she was necessarily trying to do that. She probably was doing just what Alicia said. She wants to put her sign on both sides of the street. She thought I was a good uh, place to prop it up. So, but anyway... Whatever that would be about. And, and, but my point is, how do we deal with this? We're, are we in a compromised situation when we as Baptists are standing at the uh, Planned Parenthood and Catholics start gathering around and, and they want to call us brothers and sisters and they want to kumbaya and they want to make us all part of the same thing and they want to mix it all up so that the Catholics and the Baptists are all hanging out. told you the story before but some of you haven't heard it I was uh, in Ventura again and um, we were concerned about some pornography shops that were opening up it was like what's going on here like two or three of them came into our city all around the same time it's like what's happening so we were out there protesting and doing different things and and holding up signs and the media was coming out and asking us questions and we were you know we were, we were actively trying to resist this and once again you've got every different kind of group out there some with whom we would have enough agreement to walk along, no problem. We could even pray together and all that. Others, however, with whom we have, we don't have enough agreement to like identify with them and be part of what they're doing and that kind of stuff. So it, gets, it creates a dilemma, hence the message title, the dilemma of Christian activism. Well, uh, some guy, I forget his name, you would probably recognize it if I, if I could remember it right now, Kennedy or something, some Presbyterian guy. And it wasn't the guy with the great baritone voice, not him. But uh, another well-known Presbyterian 
called me and he wanted me to come to this meeting where we're going to get together. We're going to get the churches together uh, in our community to stand up against this encroachment of pornography into our, into our town. We're going to strategize ways to stop it. And I said, well, I'm very interested in that. I said, problem is, you guys, when I, I didn't say you guys, I said, the problem is when I go to these kinds of meetings, they're always ecumenical. And I'm not into that. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to go learn from anybody what are some good things we can do to stand up against this pornography industry coming into our town. But I don't want to participate in something where what the agenda really is, is ecumenicalism. Because that's the problem. A lot of Christian activist groups, they have another agenda. Their agenda is ecumenicalism. The subtext is attacking this or that social evil. Well, maybe some of you haven't experienced that as much as I have. So let me give you this story, and it'll explain to you where I'm coming from. After I told this guy that, he assured me, no, pastor, this is not an ecumenical thing. And he even said, we, we know you. We understand your concerns. I, I will assure you this is not an ecumenical meeting. This is only a meeting about strategies we can use to stop this coming into our town. So, well, with your assurance, I'll be there. So I went. <laughs> and... Uh, they sat me, they had us seated, you know, with little name tags on your table. So I'm looking around for mine and finally found it. And, and there I sat. There's my name. And I sat down. He even spelled it right. It was very impressive. And, uh, and then sooner, sooner or later, here comes a Catholic guy all in his turned around shirt and all that stuff. And he comes in and he sits down right next to me. And his, he was right there. And I went, oh. So they put the Baptist and the Catholic right next to each other. And I said, well, that's nice. I thought, that's nice. And I reached and I pulled out a Romans road track and I said, uh, I know you're a Roman Catholic. You might like this Roman's road track. That's what I said to him. You might, you, you, I think you'll find it interesting. It'll, it'll help you sort out this whole question about whether or not you're going to go to heaven when you die. And uh, he was a little bit offended, but not real bad. He took it. And we were sitting there talking. I hope maybe he would read a little bit. Of it. I don't know. I thought, man, I'd lead this guy to Christ and probably baptize him the next Sunday. Wouldn't that be fun? They turn him into a Baptist. But anyway, so we're sitting there like that. And... Uh, uh, pretty soon the event gets going and this guy comes up, the guy that had called me or no, no, it was somebody else that came up and he's standing there and he's just exulting. He's so full. He's so excited. He said, look, we're all coming together. See how God is bringing us all together. And then he pointed to my table. He said, over there, there's a Baptist sitting next to a Catholic. Can I see it? Can I get an amen? And it was amen. This is what happens to me. So I stood up and I'm leaving. I'm going to leave. I'm walking out. And of course, everybody's watching me. I didn't really mean for that, but I didn't avoid it either. So I'm walking out and this Baptist guy gets up. It's like, it's as if this was planned. He gets up, he steps in front of me, blocks my way. So, I mean, I and he, <laughs> move over. And then he hits my shoulder. Yeah. He says, where are you going? Yeah. So I hit him back. <laughs> I'm leaving. And then, you know, I said, but thank you, because all eyes are on us. So, so, but thank you for this. And I turned and looked at the cross. So I was told this was not an ecumenical meeting. I was assured that this was about dealing with the issue of pornography and the stores coming into our town. I was lied to. You're not here concerned about that. You're here to get us all together. And so I'm leaving. And then I walked out. Nobody applauded. <laughs> they didn't like me anymore. This is the dilemma of Christian activism. There's, a, there's kind of a hidden agenda that's constantly operating behind the scenes and invisible to many people because they really, what they really want is us all to come together. That's their idea. It's something the Catholics have been trying to do ever since the Reformation. And I can get into this in some detail about all the, the clever, devious ways that they have been working, uh, you know, kind of subtly and almost invisibly trying to break down the whole Reformation. 
There was something called the Oxford Movement a while back. It was all about breaking down the barriers that have been raised between the Protestants and the Catholics. And, of course, they think of us as Protestant. But we're not. I mean, not that we don't protest. We protest, but we protest everything. We're not, we don't just limit our protests to the Catholics, man. We'll protest anything that's not lined up with the Bible. But the Protestant Reformation is something that's unique within the Catholic Church. Now, we've never identified with the Catholic Church. The Baptists have always been on the outside of that development. And so anyway, <clears throat> you see, it creates a dilemma. Well, I've got you at first, uh, 2 Corinthians 6.15. Let's read that. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? You're calling us the devil? Let me get to that. That's what I get all the time. Well, you're saying I'm Belial? I said, well, I don't know if you are or not. All I know is that uh, what you teach certainly is. Anybody that tells you that you get to God through Mary, that's Belialism. That's what it is. It's just not what the Bible says. It's, it's, not, it's not just a, oh, a little difference of opinion on an obscure passage. No, there's one God, one mediator between God and man. That's the man Christ Jesus. But what happens when you start getting involved in Christian activism and you start you know, interacting with these Catholic people and you like them and you, and you ought to, many of them are really, really fine people. This lady that I met, I think she's probably top drawer in terms of character, and, and I think her motives are sincere with regard to reaching out to these ladies. Uh, you know, I think I would put her in the category of, say, a Cornelius or something like that. And if I lived next door to Cornelius, I'd feel like I had a good neighbor. You ever read the testimony of Cornelius? It's better than most Baptists. Right? Acts chapter 10. You got to read it sometime. So you, I'm trying to, what I'm going to try to do with the message is balance this out. But that's different from a situation where we begin to say, because they're good people, the differences in their doctrine, not a big deal. Now we have a problem. And that's the danger. That's the dilemma of Christian activism, because it throws you into interaction with people on a level, which is good, by the way. By the way, I don't have any problem with that interaction. I'm, I'm, that's where I'm heading with this. I just want you to understand that you need to maintain a distinction between somebody being really nice and friendly and somebody being true to the Word of God. They're not necessarily the same thing. I'm telling you that I know some Baptists that I'd much rather, much prefer not to be around me just because of their disposition, because of their attitude or their poor character. And I know some Catholics whose character is such that I would really enjoy their company and like to be around them. You understand what I'm, where I'm going with this? Here's the problem. It doesn't change the fact that the guy's counting beads and praying to, praying to the dead. Last I checked, necromancy is a bad thing. And I'm sorry, but Mary's dead. The saints are dead. There's only one living mediator. His name is Jesus Christ the Lord. And I, when I say Mary's dead, uh, I think some of you gasped. <gasps> I don't mean she's not in heaven. I just mean she's sleeping right now. She's dead. She's going to have to wait for the resurrection. She's got to wait for the resurrection with the rest of us. Likewise, all the saints. The only guy I know, only two people I know other than Jesus Christ who went on up there are Enoch and Elijah. They're the only ones. And no, you shouldn't pray to them either. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> the fact that some of these people are nice and friendly and all this kind of stuff doesn't change the fact that they believe things that are doctrines of devils. Okay? They're doctrines of devils. They have been seduced into accepting as true things that are not true that came directly out of the heart of Satan himself. They are hellish doctrines. And this is something we've just, and you know, when I say that right now, I realize 
I'm talking to a different crowd here at Lighthouse Baptist Church, but, but even here, you know, for, for newer folks who've come in, think about this. There was a day when in the Protestant churches, the pastors were going into their pulpits and they were thundering against the hellish doctrines of Rome. The hellish doctrines of Rome. If I talk that way now, even in a good church like ours, people get a little tense. Just a little bit like, ooh, ooh. Even in our church. Imagine what happens when I'm in a, some other churches. It, it, it can get so thick with tension. You can literally feel it. So what's happened? The Catholics have been very successful. They've been successful at getting us to kind of accept the system as, eh, not so, not so big a deal. Why? Because of the interaction with the people of the system. Now, what does this mean? Should we walk around mad at every Catholic we see? That's not even Christian. Much less Baptist. But that's not kind. That, no, we're, we're kind to all men. The blood he shed upon Calvary, he shed for that Catholic you're talking to. So you should be kind and generous and loving and gracious to every person you meet, even if you have the unfortunate circumstance to meet Gavin Newsom. <laughs> you should be kind and generous and loving and with a disposition that's ready to engage him and hopefully share Christ with him. Amen? I had somebody at our church some years ago come to me and say, we're going to the White House. I'm afraid I might meet Obama. <laughs> uh, this person was serious. He said, what do I do? What do I do if he reaches his hand out to shake my hand? I said, shake his hand. What? I said, shake his hand. And while you're shaking his hand, maybe even pull him a little bit to you and say, Jesus loves you, sir. I pray for you to get saved. You don't have to have a political debate with the guy when he's just walking down the hall there and you have one moment, you have three seconds to meet, you have three seconds to talk to him and the most important thing for you is to say, you're a bum! <laughs> no. The most important thing to say is Jesus loves you. He'll save you. He'll wash your sins away. And believe me, you got a bunch of them. No, you need to add that. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say, Right? But that doesn't mean that we forget about the fact that, well, he, he's terrible. He's the worst president we've ever had. You follow what I'm saying? We, we don't begin to say, well, you know, he's not a bad guy, so now nah, we can forget about our differences politically. What? I hope not. Well, these people we meet when we're out there doing this abortion issue, they're nice people, so hey, we don't need to worry about the differences. They're probably going to go to heaven, too. You notice how uh, many people, and Baptists included, put everybody in heaven they like. If you like them, they're going to heaven. You know, you can really like somebody and they end up in hell because people don't get saved by whether or not you like them. People get saved by whether or not they humble themselves to Jesus Christ, repent of their sins, and believe on Him for salvation. That's how you get saved. Not by, uh, well, a Baptist, my Baptist neighbor likes me, so I must be going to heaven. But we tend, you know, we, we've, uh, who, who have we put in heaven just since I've been uh, trying to do this, this business of preaching? I think we put Elvis there. We got Elvis there. Go Could we like him? One guy said he put Marilyn, one guy told him Marilyn Monroe is going to be, and he can't wait to see Marilyn Monroe in heaven. Now, I don't know if she's in heaven or not, John. I, I don't know. She might be. But I don't, I, nothing I ever saw in her life gives me any reason to think she's there. There are some folks, I, if I see them in heaven, I'll say, I'm not surprised. I kind of thought maybe. And there are some people, if I see them in heaven, I'll be shocked. Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe will be two of them. 
I will be shocked, pleasantly shocked, but shocked. Whoop. And I happen to know there are some people who, if they see me there, they're going to be shocked. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> my, my point is, how could you walk together except to be agreed? Well, you know, it depends on where we're going. If we're agreed as to destination, we can walk together so long as, you know, in, with regard to getting there, I can walk with them up to there. But if we're talking about theology and, and Bible teaching, well, that's different. So let's continue reading this passage. Verse number 16, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Well, the Catholics say, Well, I'm not, I'm not worshiping idols. I'm using them as an aid to worship. Really? I'll, that's very strange to my mind because the Bible says in Exodus 20 that we are not to bow down to them nor serve them. So if you bow down to them but you're not serving them, that's okay? No, it's not okay. It's not okay to bow down to them nor is it okay to, to serve them. I, I know one situation in the book of Revelation where the angel that came to reveal all this stuff on Jesus' behalf to John so inspired John that he, the Bible says he bowed down to worship the angel that spake with him. And the angel said, See thou do it not. Stand up. Right? Well, later on in the same book, John bows down to worship before the feet of the angel. The language is very specific here. In the first instance, he bowed down to worship that angel. And the angel said, no, uh, uh And later on, it says he bowed down to worship before the feet of the angel. And the angel said the same thing. See thou do it not. So don't tell me I'm not, I'm not worshiping the idol. I'm worshiping the God behind the idol. You probably are. And the Bible says that behind idols are devils. That's what the Bible says. So you're partly right. If you're bowing down in front of images in order to worship something behind the image, let me tell you what's behind those images. According to the Bible, you got devils there. And that's why God said he doesn't want us to bow down to them nor to serve them. Now, I'm not here to preach a whole series, uh, I mean, a whole thing on the differences between what the Bible says and what the Catholics do and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I've got a series of messages that explore that quite extensively. It's available to you. But I just want to touch on that because if you're going to meet anybody on sidewalk counseling in dealing with abortion, you're going to meet Catholics. Which is so bizarre. Because the Catholic Church has not taken a stand against abortion. Doesn't that shock you? I'm a, socks are flying off everywhere in this room. <laughs> Why do you suppose they don't excommunicate Nancy Pelosi? Why don't they excommunicate Chuck Schumer? Is he a, is he a Catholic? No, I don't think he's... Uh, what is he? Oh, he's nothing. <laughs> But why, why don't they excommunicate Gavin Newsom? Why doesn't the Catholic Church excommunicate these politicians who support abortion? You've got to dig to get to it, but you will find out there has never been a formal pronouncement from the Pope that declares abortion is murder. And that's because the Catholic Church doesn't believe that it is. In terms of the actual theology of the Catholic Church, there's something called Traducianism. And it's a very strange doctrine that essentially comes down to saying this, the child is not a child until it takes its first breath outside the womb. So that's the reason that at the higher levels of the Catholic Church, there's never been a very clear pronouncement. Now, at the lower levels, among many of the bishops and, and a whole lot of the priests and many of the Catholic people, there's a very strong movement against the murder of babies in the womb. 
there's a very strong anti-abortion kind of thing going on. But not among all. You'll be shocked how many Catholics you'll meet who are not anti-abortion. They might personally feel an objection, an objection to it. They might not really like it. But within the Catholic Church, you take the whole Catholic Church as, as the whole thing. You go to some of these countries that are almost literally run by the Catholic Church, they have abortion. It's a very strange thing. And the doctrine is very complicated and when you read some of the Catholic theologians who actually get into this, they're careful how they word it. They don't want to come out and say, it's okay to kill the baby. They just say, you know, well, you know. <laughs> I have a message in which I have their quote in it, but I didn't bring that with me because I didn't expect to get into this so much. But just to, just to let you know, there's a reason that the Catholic Church does not come out and say to people like Nancy Pelosi, you're not, you're no longer, you cannot have communion. See, that's, that's the cutoff for the Catholics. If you're out of communion with the Catholic Church, then when you go to the church, they will not serve communion to you, which means you're going to hell in their system. Some of you, I can tell a whole lot of you didn't know that. I thought I'd preach this here before. Maybe not. But I'm going to go dig that sermon up. Maybe I preached that somewhere else and I forgot I hadn't preached it to you yet. Where I bring out that, that, that doctrine uh, where they believe that the baby, the viability of the baby, or not viability, the issue of the baby becoming human is when that baby comes out of the womb and takes its first breath. So from that point of view, what you're killing in the womb isn't, hasn't come to that place yet where it's received its breath from God. That's their doctrine. Now, we don't believe that. We believe from the moment of conception, a human being has, con has been conceived, and, and you have a human being there, and you're, if, you go, if you take a scalpel to it, you're killing a human being. That's what we believe. That's what we've always believed. So anyway, what agreement hath the temple of God with, with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and, will, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Be separate from whom? Well, be separate from these you know, Belial believers. You're supposed to be separate from these um, who have agreement with idols. We're supposed to be separate. We're not supposed to be identified with them. In Romans 16, 17, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Hmm. Now the Bible says, in fact, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul is begging us. That's a very strange thing to deal with. The concept that there are some places where God actually is so overburdened with a, a, a desire for something in our lives that he actually begs us. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your body a living sacrifice. God is, it's like the Holy Spirit is, is grieving and begging, please, don't you get it? If you don't give me that body, we're not going to get things done that need to be done. I can't get through you if you don't uh, let me have you. And this kind of thing, you can hear the Holy Spirit grieving. Well, here is another place where the Holy Spirit is so passionate about this issue. He says, I beseech you, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine. Now, most of the Catholics and other people, they want to put a period at the wrong place in this verse. Now, I beseech you, brother, mark them which cause divisions, period. Well, they might go ahead and add and offenses, period. But they don't like contrary to the doctrine. What the Holy Spirit is saying is that you need to mark those, that is to publicly identify those who cause divisions in doctrine. I guess doctrine matters to God. What a shocker. But it does matter to Him. And He wants us to be 
jealous in the protection of our unity in doctrine. Not our unity in fellowship. Remember, this movement has just gone crazy. These people were, I mean, I, I saw this in a big ecumenical gathering. A guy came to the Bible with his Bible, uh, came to the pulpit with his Bible, and he sets it down, and he says a few words, and then he moves it aside. So we need to move the Bible out of our way, out of the way of our fellowship. Yeah. The Catholic Church has gone so far that way right now. The Pope they have at present, well, you talk about breaking down barriers. He's reaching across the aisle to the Muslims. He's reaching out to the Hindu, pagan. He's, he's, you talk about breaking down barriers. Totally ecumenical. And he's compromising a lot of Catholic dogma to do it. And there are many Catholics who are very upset about that. So the Catholic Church is not this monolithic unity they pretend to be. There are all kinds of divisions within the Catholic Church. And it goes all the way back to the Reformation. And I'm praying that there'll be another Reformation. There'll be another splintering in the, in the Catholic hierarchy, the Catholic system. You know, the Catholics have had a really, really bad past, and they've got a really, really bad future. If you check your Bible, you go to Revelation 17, that whore that rides the scarlet-colored beast with the seven heads. The beast isn't Rome, but the whore is. And she's the religious system of Rome. We haven't got that far into our study in Revelation. We will be getting there, and when we do, it's going to be very revealing. But God, yeah, there, there's a... He's made it very clear what, what the future of the whore is. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of our church because I can talk like that. And I only feel a little bit of vibration. A little bit of... Or some places I talk like that and it gets like tense. Why? It's Bible. God calls her a whore. That's what God calls it. Well, he can't talk like that. I know, because you're better than God. You're more righteous than God. You're more pure than God. Your ethical standards are above God's ethical standards. It's just ridiculous. The Bible refers to her as a whore for a very important reason that I don't have time to explore right now uh, other than other beyond the fact that God recognizes her as a whore. Religiously speaking, of course. And he tells us that that Roman system is going to be cast into the street and it's going to be burnt on fire and totally destroyed. And we won't even have to lift a finger for that to happen. The scarlet colored beast is going to do that. Hallelujah, we won't even be here. More on that later on. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, hang out with him. Invite him to your church. Let him preach. After all, we want to maintain dialogue. Oh, wait a minute. I must have been reading some other version. No, what the Bible says, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. These Bible verses have meaning. We can't just smorgasbord our religion, you know, and go through the Bible and say, I'll take a little bit of this on my plate, and then, hmm, not yeah, like that, hmm, I don't want any of that separation stuff. Let me get over here to, no. The Bible teaches separation. You go back through the scripture, you, did you know that the Bible begins with an act of separation? Well, maybe I can't say it begins there, but it gets there real soon. <laughs> In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was with, and the next verse, and the, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the first thing God did is he separated the light from the darkness. Starts right there. Separation. You go through the scripture and you, trace, you, you, tra you track that out, 
And you'll see it over and over and over again. He separated Abraham from the rest of the tribes. And out of Abraham, he separated Jacob from Isaac. And out of, out of Jacob, he separated Judah. And he separated David out of that. When sin got into Israel, God separated ten tribes from the two. We can go earlier than that. When Nimrod brought all the kingdoms out from under God, under him, God broke his tower up and separated everybody out across the earth. God's reaction is always separation. God is not that keen on unification. He wants unity within the separated unit. But separation is his modus operandi. And that's why the world hates it. The world hates it. And worldling Christians hate it. They have a hatred for it that's kind of almost scary. How vicious they will get if you want to maintain your separation. Even if you do it with kindness. They, they just they get angry with you. You are a threat to them. Somehow you're a threat. Why? Why am I a threat to you? I just prefer to be Baptist. Okay. You go do your Episcopalian thing. That's fine. But now you Baptist, you think you're just you think you're just all by yourself and that you know nobody else matters but you and that you you're the truth and nobody Whoever said any of that? You know, every bit of that kind of stuff is said by the devil about us. We've never said that. As far as whether or not we believe we have the truth and they don't, well, yeah, the Bible says that. I mean, I got a book in my hand. Yeah, take care of that for you. I mean, you show me what you believe in here, and there's my unity. This is the unity book. If we agree in here, we be good. If we disagree about this, we got a problem. I mean, you might not even be Baptist. But if you believe this book, we're good. What a shock. Because it's the book. It's about what the Bible says. Amen? So let me, I got to kind of move over into, a, into something like a conclusion here. But we need to be careful with, in Christian activism that we don't compromise our commission. Our commission is to preach the gospel. And the gospel is that transforming message. It's the only message that will actually change the human heart. It's the only one. We can talk people into things or out of things and all that, and that's all fine and good. There's a place for that, but the bottom line is it's a heart problem. The reason these people are killing their babies is because their heart is not yielded to God. They got a heart problem, and the gospel heals the heart problem. The only way to get real, effective, enduring social change is when the hearts of people are changed by the glorious power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our mission. Our mission isn't to go out there and try to get lost people to act like saved people. Our mission is to go out there and get lost people to become saved people. That doesn't mean we're not concerned about how they behave. Of course we are, but you get my point. The ultimate objective. Whereas in Christian activism, so often the ultimate objective is not the gospel. The ultimate objective is social reformation. I think social reformation comes from preaching the gospel. But they say, you preaching the gospel, we don't need that. 
These people don't need to hear that. And that's where we have conflict sometimes with some of those groups. However, we must preach the whole counsel of God. Acts 20, verse 27. Not just the gospel. We don't take the gospel message and then separate it from the Bible and leave all the rest of that back there because that just gets in the way of the gospel. What? I guess God didn't think so because he put the gospel in that book. So anybody who takes the gospel and separates it out of the context of its scripture and starts trying to preach it, really market it, like a good salesman, they will invariably begin to change the message and cut some things away, like that strong odor of sulfur on the doctrine of hell. Get that, let's perfume it. Let's separate. The, we don't need to talk about hell. Just, you see, that always happens. Anybody who has taken the gospel out of the context of the rest of the counsel of Scripture, the whole counsel of God, has taken the first step toward compromising the gospel. The Bible declaring the gospel says that Jesus Christ died for our sins and was buried on the third day rose again, right? Amen. I didn't mean to be, I'm not trying to be mean, but I, I did that on purpose. I kind of drew you in. But don't, don't be mad at me now. This is going to be a teaching moment for you. The Bible says he died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures. Any gospel that's not according to the scriptures is not the gospel. It's according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 to 3. You can't take the gospel and separate it from the scriptures and have a gospel. Amen? It'll become something else. And it always does. In every case where that's, that's been tried, the gospel must be understood within the context of the scriptures where the gospel is given to us. Some other stuff that I'll go into a little bit later on, but understand that not only does Christian activism sometimes pressure us to compromise our commission, it also sometimes compromises our convictions. There's the powerful seduction of inclusivism or ecumenicalism. Virtually every false Christian sect out there wants to use Christian or tries to use Christian activism as a kind of Trojan horse to infiltrate your church or your life with the ecumenical message. We cannot yoke up. We cannot yoke. Now this is a very important distinction because I'm, I'm walking along serving the Lord and I'm yoked up with you guys. So as we are yoked together and moving forward in ministry, there might be another yoked group. There are all kinds of yokels. So they're yoked up over there. I'm yoked up over here. And they might be going down the same street I'm on. But I'm not yoked with them. I'm yoked to this cart. Not to that one. So it's the yoke that is the difference. I can go to the Planned Parenthood over here in Santa, uh, Santa Maria and stand there, and I'm yoked with you. But watch how they will invariably try to yoke you to them. That's why I was interested in that little move right there. But I didn't say anything because it wasn't necessarily the case. It might have been just as innocent as, as what we're talking about here. So, but I was a little confused. I go, hmm. You trying to yoke me? <laughs> they want to do that. They want to draw you in and make you part of them. That's what they want to do. And you got to say, no, you, you kind of hang with your own yoke folk. I hang with my yoke. You got your yoke. And that's no yoke. Anyway. That was bad. 
<laughs> and maybe on that note, I should end <laughs> this message. <coughs> so let's stand together, please.